This is the fifth video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video, we'll be looking at vaccination and immunity, as well as looking at the production of monoclonal antibodies. So in this lesson, we will look at how the immune system deals with infectious microorganisms. We will look at how immunization was invented by Edward Jenner, as well as how immunization works. And finally, we will look at how monoclonal antibodies work, as well as what we can use them for. So how does the immune system deal with infection? Well, in the previous video tutorial, B3.4, we looked at how bacterial populations can grow. So once microorganisms have entered the body, they reproduce rapidly until they are destroyed. That's what our immune system does, and in particular, the white blood cells. White blood cells travel around in the blood and go around the body looking for these microorganisms. Some of the white blood cells are known as B lymphocytes. This is a B lymphocyte here. B lymphocytes come across invading microorganisms and they produce antibodies. Every pathogen has a unique molecule on its surface. These molecules are called antigens. When the B lymphocytes come across a foreign antigen, they start to produce proteins called antibodies, which bind and lock on to the invading cells. The antibodies produced are specific to that pathogen, so they will not lock on and kill other pathogens. Antibodies are then produced rapidly and flow all around the body to kill all similar bacteria or viruses. This is known as the body's immune response. When the body is infected by a pathogen for the first time, the immune response is very slow. We can see this on the graph here. This is because there aren't many B lymphocytes that can make the antibody required to lock on to the antigen. Eventually, the body will produce enough of the right antibody to overcome the infection. Meanwhile, the infected person will show symptoms of the disease. This is where we have the primary immune response that has low affinity antibodies. With the infection being cleared in this part of the graph. After being exposed to an antigen, a special type of B lymphocyte is produced. This is known as a memory lymphocyte. Memory lymphocytes remain in the body for a long time and remember the specific antibody. This is how the person becomes immune. The immune system has the ability to respond quickly to a second infection. So if the same pathogen enters the body again at this secondary exposure here, we can see that the immune system produces a quicker and stronger immune response. The immune response is much, much higher. We have much higher affinity antibodies. The secondary response often gets rid of the pathogen before you begin to show any symptoms, and this can be seen across this graph. We can use the body's immune system in order to create immunizations and vaccinations. Immunization or vaccination is a way of preventing someone from becoming ill. We currently immunize against many diseases, including measles, mumps, and rubella. Immunization involves injecting dead or inactive microorganisms into the body. These are antigenic, so they carry the antigens, so even though they're harmless to your body, your body will still attack them and make antibodies. Therefore, the antigens trigger the production of memory lymphocytes. If the live, full-power microorganisms of the same disease then get into your system at a later date, they'll be killed very quickly by the antibodies which you've already developed against them. Therefore, this is a way of getting the body to develop an immune response to very dangerous and often fatal diseases. The first example of vaccination was carried out by Edward Jenner in 1796. Edward Jenner was a scientist who lived in the 1700s. A major disease around that time was smallpox that killed lots and lots of people. Those that didn't die were left with horrible scars for the rest of their life. Jenner noticed that milkmaids caught smallpox a lot less often than members of the general population. However, he also knew that milkmaids caught cowpox, 
which was a mild disease that they caught from cattle. And he noticed that those that had had cowpox did not get smallpox. <coughs> Therefore, he hypothesised that if you'd had cowpox, maybe this prevented you from getting smallpox. So what did Jenner do? Well, first of all, he found a young orphan boy who was going to be his test subject. He then took bits of a scab from a girl who had cowpox, so from a milkmaid. He then made a small incision on the boy's arm and put those bits of scab into the cut on the arm of the boy. Lo and behold, the boy then developed cowpox. However, as cowpox isn't a particularly dangerous disease, the boy was unwell for a while, but then recovered. Once the boy had recovered, he then made a second incision on the boy's arm and this time took bits of a scab from someone who had smallpox and rubbed that into the wound. However, he noticed that the boy did not catch smallpox. So Jenner's theory was correct. If you'd had cowpox, you did not catch smallpox. This was because the cowpox antigens triggered the boy's B lymphocytes to produce antibodies. Smallpox has some of the same antigens as cowpox, so when the boy was infected with smallpox, his immune system quickly produced antibodies to stop him from getting the disease. He had been immunised. Nowadays, we will inject dead or inactive pathogens, but the same principles of Jenner's method still apply today. Immunisation does, however, have both positives and negatives. On the positive side, big outbreaks of diseases called epidemics or even pandemics can be prevented if a large percentage of the population are immunised. Even the people who aren't immunised are less likely to catch the disease because there are fewer people who are able to pass it on. Also, a large number of diseases, for example smallpox, have been virtually wiped out by immunisation programmes, so they are not an issue anymore in the modern world. However, immunisation doesn't always work, sometimes it doesn't give you the immunity, and also you can sometimes have a bad reaction to the vaccine, so things like swelling or even things like fevers and seizures. However, these bad reactions are very, very rare. And millions of people in the UK have a flu vaccination every year. Antibodies aren't only used by the immune system, we can also use them in order to generate monoclonal antibodies. We will choose to generate a monoclonal antibody if we have a really useful antibody and we want to make lots and lots of copies of this. In order to do this, we need to create a hybridoma. A hybridoma is when we fuse two types of cells together. We need to do this as B lymphocytes do not divide very easily. However, there is another type of cell, a tumour cell, which divides very, very quickly and can be grown very easily. In order to create our hybridoma, we use the following method. So to start with, we get our antigen and we inject it into a mouse. This causes the mouse to produce B lymphocytes, which will be producing antibodies against this antigen. So we isolate those B lymphocytes and we remove them. We then take our tumour cell and we fuse it with our B lymphocyte to create our hybridoma. The hybridomas are then screened to ensure they are making the correct antibody. As the hybridoma has been made from a tumour cell, it will divide very quickly which enables us to produce lots of identical antibodies, and these are called monoclonal antibodies. We can make a monoclonal antibody that will bind to anything we want. So as long as there is an antigen on the surface of a type of cell, we can produce an antibody that will bind to that antigen. This is useful as they will only bind to one target molecule. We can use monoclonal antibodies for a variety of uses. You need to know about four of these uses for GCSE. 
The first two ways that we can use them is that we can make monoclonal antibodies that stick to cancer cells. So different cells in the body have different antigens on their surface. So we can make a monoclonal antibody that will bind to specific cells. Cancer cells have antigens on their membranes that aren't found on normal body cells. These are known as tumour markers. So therefore, we can use monoclonal antibodies that will specifically bind to these antigens. This enables us to use monoclonal antibodies in two ways. The first way is we can use them to diagnose cancer. In this case, the antibodies that we're producing are labelled with a radioactive element. The labelled antibodies are given to a patient through a drip and they go into the bloodstream until they reach a cancer cell, at which point they will bind to the tumour markers. We can then take a radiograph or a picture of the patient's body to identify where the radioactive markers are found. This means that anywhere that a cancer cell is found, a bright spot will show up on the picture. Doctors then can see exactly where the cancer is, what size it is, and also if it is spreading. However, we can also use monoclonal antibodies in order to treat cancer cells. This time, instead of a radioactive marker, we attach an anti-cancer drug to the monoclonal antibodies. Once again, these are given through a drip, and the antibodies will target the specific cells and bind to those tumour markers. The drug kills the cancer cells but doesn't kill any normal body cells near the tumour due to the specificity of the monoclonal antibody to those tumour markers. This is an advantage over other cancer treatments, for example chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which affect normal body cells as well as killing the cancer cells. Therefore, the side effects of an antibody-based drug are much lower than that for other drugs or radiotherapy. For a recap on radiotherapy, please move to the Edexcel P3 revision tutorial series, which looks at radiotherapy and radioactive treatments in much more detail. We can also use monoclonal antibodies in order to find blood clots. A blood clot is where proteins in the blood join together and form a solid lump. Monoclonal antibodies have been developed that bind specifically to these proteins. Then, like with cancer, we can attach a radioactive element to these bodies and then take a radiograph or a picture of the patient's body and any bright spots will identify where a blood clot is found. This is very useful because you can easily find a potentially harmful blood clot and then you can carry out procedures to remove it. The final use of monoclonal antibodies that you need to know for GCSE is that monoclonal antibodies can be used in pregnancy tests. This is because there is a hormone that is only found in the urine of women who are pregnant. This means that we can test for this using monoclonal antibodies. This is how pregnancy testing sticks work. On the pregnancy stick, there is a bit of the stick that you pass urine onto. This has some antibodies to the hormone with blue beads attached to them. The test strip, which is the bit of the stick that turns blue if you're pregnant, has some more antibodies to the hormone stuck on it so that they can't move. If you're pregnant and you wee on the stick, the hormone binds the antibodies on the blue beads, the urine moves up the stick, carrying the hormone and the beads, and then the beads and the hormone bind to the antibodies on the strip. So the blue beads get stuck on the strip, turning it blue if the woman is pregnant. However, if you're not pregnant and you weigh on the stick, the urine still moves up the stick carrying the blue beads, but there's nothing to stick the blue beads onto the test strip, so the test strip does not go blue. This concludes this video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. Today we have looked over vaccination, the immune system, as well as monoclonal antibodies. In the next video tutorial, B3.6, we will be looking over the plant science aspects of B3. This will include plant defences, periodicity and circadian rhythms, and finally plant communication and co-evolution.